Okay, welcome to, uh, I think this is lecture 19 uh, on Mora Nevuchim, on Rambam's Guide for the Perplexed. We left last time in the middle of chapter 21, and Rambam was discussing uh, the meaning of the term la'avor, to pass over. And um, he analyzed the uh, chapter which we read through um, in, in Exodus and Parshat Kitisa, where he talked about, where the Torah talks about the sublime encounter between uh, Moshe and, and God himself, so to speak, um, and specifically concentrated on the words Vayavor Hashem al Panov Vayikra, and God passed over his face. So the, just a quick recap, the, um, the first explanation that Ramam gave to that verse, well, the, the obvious difficulty to someone like Ramam who's trying to get us away from anthropomorphic ideas is how could this be that God passes over? What does that mean that God passed over anyone? What does it mean that, uh, um, uh, uh, that God said, I you see my face, not see my face? It seems like God is a physical being if you look at the words um, in their literal translation. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So Ramam explained that the word la'avor is also often means to, to miss a target or to pass beyond a target. And uh, but the, Ramam's explanation was va'avor Hashem al panov. The panov was not referring to God passed over Moshe's face. In other words, that he passed by Moshe which would give you the idea that there, there was some sort of a godly being that passed in front of Moshe, but rather it means Moshe was asking God to see pun of his face. And God said, You're tr you, you want to know my essence, which was being re referred to as face because the face is the way we, we can per we perceive a person, who a person is. So therefore, we, it, in reference to God, it means God's essence. So Moses wanted, Moshe wanted to know, and God said, no, that can't be. By Avor Hashem Apanav, God passed Moshe over from seeing his face to rather seeing his midos, his, his, his attributes, and Vayikra, and then God called out, you can know me by my attributes. You can know me by the way you experience me, by the way you relate to me, but you can't know me. And that was Rambam's explanation. That's just a recap of the, his first explanation. But now Rambam is going to give another explanation by one of Rambam's heroes. So Rambam had a, a, a big hero, and that was Unclus. Unclus, who is the writer of the Targum Unclus, the translation, the Aramaic translation of the Torah that and uh, if uh, you know, anyone who opens a standard Chumash, a standard uh, uh, you know uh, a Torah, uh, version of the Chumash in any synagogue, they'll they'll have there the Hebrew text and next to it the Aramaic translation written by Unclus. Now, who who just a brief uh, review? Who uh, and we'll see in a minute why Unclus was one of Rambam's heroes, and he quotes him a lot. Um, but Onclus was a convert to Judaism. He was from a, a royal Roman family, some Roman noble. Some, uh, some versions have him as being a nephew of Hadrian. Some have him of being a nephew of Titus, the general. Um, but uh, some historians uh, argue, uh, say that neither of those are possible. But regardless, he was a, a, a nephew uh, or a member of a Roman noble family who lived somewhere in the uh, the first century according in, on the Christian calendar, um, uh, sometime during that time period, the late second temple period and the early post temple period after the destruction. And he wrote the first real translation um, to the Torah and he wrote the translation in Aramaic. And until relatively recently, about four or 500 years ago, a lot of Jewish communities had the custom and this was the custom in the time of the Talmud to read the Torah in the Hebrew and then immediately translate into Unclus' version, Aramaic translation. And Unclus, and, uh, because most of the people didn't speak Hebrew by that time, the, the common language that was spoken by the Jewish people during that time period was Aramaic. So they, they read the Torah with a translation. I am told that there still are some uh, Yemenite congregations that still have that custom to read Unclus Targum, <laughs> Unclus' translation. Regardless, Unclus, was therefore the one who taught Torah to the Jewish people during those, that period of time. That's how they had access to what the Torah 
uh, taught. So, um, so wh why did Rambam like Onkelos so much? So let's see. We'll see why in a minute, and you'll understand right away. So I am on, in the Pines edition. Uh, the place where I'm up to now is page 49, and there's a long chapter. If you look in the middle, somewhere maybe around 10 to 12 lines down, there's a sentence that says, the Aramaic translation of the Bible. That's where I'm up to uh, there. That's where he transitions from his own interpretation to Onkelos' interpretation of that same verse. Now, um, so if I read in the English, the Aramaic translation of the Bible when rendering this verse does what it customarily does in similar cases. So what Ramam is referring to, and I have to uh, come outside of the text for a little to explain. Ramam is going to describe a pattern that Onkelos has when he translates just about every time in the Torah when there's an anthropomorphic reference to God, right? When there's when uh, something that Rambam would find philosophically very difficult, the Onkelos um, changes it, but he, doesn't ch he changes it in a very consistent way. So whenever it says God, he says the something of God, right? So, so the voice of God, the sound of God, the, the strength of God, the, so uh, depending on the particular um, uh, context of whichever verse it's talking about, and we'll have some examples soon. Um, so over here, Onkelos does the same thing that he does all over the place. And that is instead of saying by Avar Hashem Alpanov, which is an accurate Aramaic translation would be, and, and God passed over his face or passed by his face, right? He translated the blank of God. And you'll see in the minute what that translation is. So, and now I'm going to read that inside in the, in the pines, uh, for in every case in which it finds that a thing is ascribed to God, to which the doctrine of corp corporeality or some concomitants of this doctrine are attached, it assumes the nomen regens. Now the nomen regens, I had to look this up myself, but basically it's, it's a, it's a gr grammatical concept, which happens a lot in the Hebrew language. And that is, is you have two nouns. And in wiki dictionary or whatever dictionary I saw online that described to me what nomen regens means, it uses the Hebrew example of malkat shiva, I mean, literally that would mean the queen of Sheba, right? Both of which are nouns, right? Now, the, the, uh, if you imagine a verse which would say uh, shiva, Sheba went to such and such a place. And obviously it doesn't mean Sheba, that's a place, it's a country. So it, the nomen regens would be the, the noun which describes the other noun, the queen of. So Malkat, who was the one that walked to that place or went to that place? It was the queen of Sheba, but sometimes it leaves that word out, the queen of. So when it says over here and it considers the, so, so there, so thus, when scripture says, I skipped a little bit, when the Torah says, and behold, the Lord stood erect upon it. Okay, so that would be, Vihine um, Hashem Nitzav Olav, right? That would be, uh, uh, that's, the, that's the reference to the story of the Jacob and the ladder. And God was standing above it, above the, at top of the ladder. So how does Unclus translate that, right? You could have several ways of trying to translate that and get around the, the corporeality of God problem, right? You can say it was just Jake Yaakov's dream. He thought he saw an image which in his dream meant God, et cetera. There's all kinds of ways. But Unclus, the, the, the writer of the Aramaic translation, what he writes is, right, yak, I'm going to read the actual Aramaic, yakra da Hashem me'atad alavohi, right, that the glory of God stood displayed on, above it, right, or another example, right, it says, when it says, yitzof Hashem be'niu ve'necha, right, which is referring to the, um, that's the story of, um, I'm pretty sure that's Lavan, where, where Lavan says to J Jacob when he's leaving, he says, God will watch between you and I. So what does it mean God will watch? He says, the word of God will watch. In other words, this, the, the agreement that we're making, the word of God will watch. So he, take, he puts in that extra word, the word of God, right? This occurs throughout the translation of Onkelos, peace be upon him, says Rama. So therefore, so the same thing that he does in those two, other two examples, Rambam also does, I mean, Onkelos also does here. He does the same thing with regard to the dictum of scripture, the words that we're talking about here, which are 
Um, Vayavar Hashem al panav. Right? Those are the Hebrew words that we're familiar with from the Torah, the actual verse, which literally in, we translate into English, and God passed by his face. Now, what, what's the, what does Targum Unkla say? What's the Aramaic? Va'avar Hashem shechintei al apoi ukara, right? And, and, and God passed his presence by his face and then called out. So there's this creation of God, right? Called his presence, his whatever that is. And we're, the Ramam is going to get to that in a minute. But what Unklis is doing, he's taking it a step away. It wasn't God himself. It was some representation, something that God made called, which he's calling the presence, right? The Shekhinta, right? Now, this is important because when we, when we read about the Shechina, which is generally translated the divine presence, and we read the Shechina most famously regarding the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, that God's presence rested upon it, we generally think that that's the essence of God. And Ramam is telling us now, and he's going to say this a little bit clearer later, that, that it's not, there is no essence of God, right? Remember, this is that's the whole point, right? Shechinta, is a creation of God. It's, it's a holy presence that God creates, that God makes. So God decided and said, this place is holy, right? So now, so therefore, thus, according to him, it was in, in, indubitably, it was definitely a created thing that passed by. He considers the, in, in the so, so, and how does he know this? How does Onkelis prove this? Because if you look back just a couple of verses before, God says in, in verse 22, um, chapter 33, God says, when my honor will pass before you. God doesn't say, and it will be when I pass before you, it will be when my kavod, in other words, it's an entity, it's something that God created will pass in front of, of Moshe. So the interpret, so, the, so therefore, uh, the same thing, uh, the interpret, and, 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 and in this case, the panav is referring to the face of Moshe, right, as opposed to the face of God himself. No, it's Rambam's first interpretation was Panav meant his face. Now, Panav means Moshe's face. So the interpretation, the, okay. So this is too is an excellent interpretation that may be approved of. So this is another shot, another explanation of that verse, which gets around the problem of the anthropomorphism of describing God as if, as if he was a corporeal being. And, um, a corroboration of the interpretation of Unclus the proselyte, you know, Unclus the Ger, uh, may his memory be blessed, may be found in the dictum of scripture, right, um, uh, which, which I, just, I just read to you. Sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit because I'm looking at the Hebrew and English at the same time. Okay, so this verse makes it clear that what passes is a thing related to God, but not the essence of God himself. And thus it is the glory that the scripture says, until I have passed by, and when the Lord passed by before his face. So now, and so that, so that, so now we have two explanations. One is, is that it's referring to the glory or the shechina of God that that was a created being. But there's another way we can explain this too. And Ramam is going to say the same kind of way that Onkelos explains with this, with the left, the nomen regens being left out. The if it is necessary to assume an omitted nomen regens, as is always done by Onkelos, if we have to leave, if we're going to assume that a word. That is meant to be in the text, which is left out for in accord with the context. Sometimes, because because as we see, Unclus, when he refers to God, he often would would put in. Sometimes the omitted word is the glory, the indwelling, which is the English term for shechina, the presence. And sometimes he takes it to be the word of God. We, for our part, we can do the same thing here and say that what was it that passed before Moshe? This is this is explanation number three. What was it that passed before Moshe? By Avor Hashem al Panov, the voice of God passed before Moshe, right? By Yikra, and it called out. This seems to be the Ramam is going to be like his favorite one of the three explanations, right? The assumption accordingly would be that the verse should read, and the voice of the Lord passed by before him and called. We have already explained that the Hebrew language uses passage in a figurative sense with reference to voice, right? And we see, and they caused a voice to pass throughout the camp. So we see when a sound passes through an area, the Torah several times uses the same language of to pass through or to pass by. So the same thing over here would mean by Avar, Hashem, the voice of God, or right, passed by. Um, 
uh, I'm going to kind of skip a little, just read pretty quickly, because um, I kind of explained it outside. You should not, cons and the fact that a call, a kriya, right, in other words, the uh, words, are ascribed to a voice as opposed to being ascribed to a person shouldn't be surprising, right? Because um, we find in many places that we have a voice speaking as opposed to an actual person speaking. One of the most famous ones is one of the one of my most favorite chapters in the in all of Tanakh, and that is um, from the book of Isaiah, uh, a the the uh, chapter forty, which we read. Uh, on the Shabbat after Tisha B'Av and Nachmu uh, Nachmu Ami, comfort, comfort my nation. So Isaiah is speaking beautifully and poetically about, about the future redemption. And he says, Kol Omer Kukira, right? A voice rings out, proclaims the Amar Ma'ekra, and the voice says, Ma'ekra, what shall I call out? Right? And it says, Kol Habasar Chatzir, all of flesh, all living beings are like grass, the Kol Chasto and all of the goodness is like the, the flowers of the field. And it keeps on, uh, uh, and uh, um, so you see over there, kol omer kura. Um, uh, again, the verse, several verses before that, it says, um, uh, kol kore bamidbar, a voice is calling out in the wilderness, panu derech Adonai, clear the path of God, yashru barava, straighten out and level out the, in the wilderness, mesila leloheinu, a pathway for us to reach God. So so from there we see a, um, the same idea that a voice calls out. And I think the Ramam didn't pick this example for, for no reason. Um, that voice of redemption is all, could also be what's being referred to here when God says at the time of the, at the, the lowest point of Jewish history, right after the golden calf, God passes over Moshe's face and calls out in a voice, Hashem, Hashem, Kerachem, Hanan, God, God, the God of mercy, the God of compassion, and so on. And so forth. So, um, so according to if you learn it this way, right? Then, um, then when that voice calls out, it says Hashem, Hashem, right? God, God, right? It's similar to when a voice calls out, and we find many times in the Torah when God says Moshe, Moshe, he said he calls out Moshe's name twice, or Avraham, Avraham. Right? Uh, um, so this is so this third explanation would be uh, Rama ends this paragraph. This too is a very fine interpretation. So there's three explanations, but we're not done yet because he's going to give more. But first he says, um, you should not consider as blameworthy. Don't think, don't be uh, afraid of the, don't, don't start yelling at me and saying uh, that uh, this profound subject, which is so remote from our apprehension, this tremendously deep idea should be subject to so many different interpretations that we have. I've just listed three ways of understanding it, and there's three ways to see it. For this does no harm with respect to that towards with we, which, which you redirect yourselves. We can learn all of these explanations and we can learn something from all of them. None of them take us away from the objective of understanding the lesson the Torah is trying to teach. And you are free to choose whatever belief you wish. In other words, if one of them speaks to you more than the other one, then fine, go ahead and take that one. If you like the idea that that, that it's referring to God telling Moshe, you cannot see my essence, but you can see how I relate to you, then that's the meaning of the verse that that speaks to your heart. If the idea is that God created a, a, a presence, a something, a, a something that Moshe could sense and feel and pass in front of Moshe, um, um, and, and, then, and then called out the attributes of God, if that speaks to you, fine. If it speaks to you, the idea that God is like a voice, a voice that calls out to us, and, 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 and calls out to us and says these attributes and, and ca calls and the voice calls God himself and says, God, God, I'm a God of mercy. If that speaks to you, fine. You also can believe a fourth explanation, the Ramam goes on. You may believe that the great station attained by Moshe was in Dubai entire, entirely a vision of prophecy. In other words, maybe this whole thing wasn't even something that actually happened in real life, so to speak. This was just purely a vision. It was, it was like, it was a dream. Moshe was being given this vision. So the fact that he saw God passing in front of him doesn't mean anything about the corporeality of God. We can imagine all sorts of things in our minds. We can see all kinds of things. Whatever Moshe saw, there's obviously no way we'll know what it was, but it was something that to him represented the essence of God, right? Namely, that which he demanded, that which was denied to him, and that which we, he apprehended, being intellectual, 
and admitting of no recourse to the sentence. In other words, it was a completely intellectual comprehension. There was, he, he didn't smell anything. He didn't see anything. He didn't hear anything. He didn't taste anything. No senses actually sensed it because God can't be sensed by human senses. So that's a fourth explanation, right? It was all a dream. It was all a vision of prophecy. Or you may believe that there was, or maybe, maybe it wasn't a dream, but maybe there was some sort of an apprehension due to the sense of sight. Maybe Moshe was standing there and he saw something. There was something that he saw and apprehended with his eyes. But exactly what that is, however, had for its object, so the, uh, whatever it was, it was something that God created. It wasn't God himself, right? Those seeing, um, through seeing which the perfection of intellectual apprehension might be achieved. And by seeing it, Moshe apprehended whatever it was that he saw, which would, and this would be, this is the same as Onkelos's first explanation. The first explanation that we brought in the name of Onkelos was that God created his honor or some entity, his shechina, that passed in front of Moshe, right? Or you can also say, um, and I'm going to skip a little, or again, you may believe that there was an addition and apprehension due to the sense of hearing. Maybe Moshe felt or heard this presence of God passing in front of him, and that was the, the point of the voice. The bottom line is, is I'm going to skip to the end. It, as long as you realize any one of these explanations are all fine, as long as you recognize and realize that it wasn't God himself passing in front of Moshe, because as, as he ends in the last sentence, it is therefore impossible that he should have been said to pass by because God is, may he be honored and magnified, is not a body and is not permitted to ascribe motion to him. We can't say that God went anywhere. He never passed in front of anybody right because that's not a thing that's even relevant when re referencing god so here we have um numerous explanations by rambam of explaining this term la avar to pass over and and rambam really uh, really kind of um uh uh, uh wrung this one out uh, kind of uh, 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 the, how 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 many different ways we can interpret the word right and understand the verse and gain something from the verse without having to imagine God as a physical presence of some sort. Um, before I go on to the next one, I want to know if anyone has any questions or comments about avor, about passing over or passing by. Feel free to unmute yourself. If there isn't any, then we'll move on. Or if you want to speak up later, please do so. Feel free to do so. Uh, the next, the next, uh, ver ver there's two more words that I want to try to cover tonight uh, that he covers. And um, I was, uh, I just want to mention, I was speaking with my son uh, a couple nights ago, and we were, I can't remember, it was some current event that we were discussing. And, and it was clear that the two parties that were arguing about whatever, I don't remember what the issue was, they, they each, the argument was completely based on the fact that they each had a completely different definition of what the term was that they were arguing about, right? And you, if you see this, take two political parties and they discuss a, an issue. And one of them's talking about one thing and the other one's talking about another thing and they're screaming and yelling at each other, sometimes making good points, right? But one of them's, one of them's interpretation of the concept is so different from the other one's interpretation of the concept that they just talk right past each other, right? Which is why, and I, I, it occurred to me then, uh, you know, how important it is and why Ramam emphasizes so much on going through the meanings of terms, right? Because if you can't agree to the definition of the term, then you can't even have the remainder of the conversation. The, the, any debate needs to begin by what are we even talking about, <laughs> right? When you say X, Y, Z, what do you mean? We have to define it. And if we agree on a definition, then we can go and have a discussion and a debate about it. But if we can't even agree on a definition, then we'll be talking about different things. So that's why it's so important that the Ramam has to say, if we're going to argue or not necessarily, sometimes yes, argue and debate, but sometimes just discuss or try to understand the meaning of the verses of the Torah, right? If we don't agree on the meaning of the words themselves, we can't even start. And uh, so that's why the first section of this book is so emphasizes so much the meanings of these terms. Obviously, he can't go to the meaning of every single term in the Torah, but he's picking the main ones that can lead to the most controversial conclusions and that will lead to the main themes of the, of the, the rest of the book. 
So I know it might seem like it's dragging on and on, but this is really, really important for us to get it. So anyway, ba, the next one is the word ba, to come, right? Which we say is, right, habia, the word of coming, the Lashona every in the Hebrew language. And now we're, we're on, um, on chapter 22 in the Pines. And I, I apologize for jumping back and forth from the Hebrew to the English. Sometimes I just do it randomly and sometimes I do it for a reason. This one was just random. So, um, uh, 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 right? It's referring to etayuto, something coming, something comes to a specific place, right? So the, the real actual word means, right? I, can, I come home, right? You know, it means there's a specific place that's home. And I come, I came home, I got there. Or it could mean um, uh, uh, you, the, 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 a person comes to another person, right? Right, you're like that. That's a, that. That verse is a reference to, um, uh, you know, when Yaakov stole the blessings from Esau by by coming in a sneaky way. Right, he came to Yitzchak to Isaac in a sneaky way. Right. It also refers to um, uh, when when a live animal, a live person, a live being, right, um, enters into a specific place. Joseph came home. When you will come into the land. Once, but this, the word was then lent out to be used in other, lent out, so to speak, to be used in other contexts. So, for example, um, um, ki avod, um, when thy words come to pass, we may do the honor, right? Ki, the words, ki avod badnucha, right? May asher alecha, when these things come upon you. So that's not referring to a thing coming to a place, right? But it's referring to a, 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 an event right, that comes to pass, right, and if, in English, we have the same thing, we use the word come, even when we're not referring to an actual object coming to a place, right, so, so, um, so, and then from there, it gets lent out to another use, right, uh, to even bad things, like evil came upon someone, what does it mean evil came upon someone, right, and darkness came, uh, there isn't an entity called evil that actually walks around and comes to places, right? It means that evil started happening to this person. So, the, uh, and, and in a similar way, and once it becomes that word is acceptable and it's being used to describe things that aren't actual entities, now it could be also used to refer to God, right? To something that, something to God who has nobody at all, right? And therefore it, it can refer to, to God himself. Um, it was also figuratively applied to the creator. I'm on page uh, 52 now, like on the fourth line and the fifth line in the pine, either to the descent of his decree or to that of his indwelling. Meaning when the Shekhinah, when God's presence, that presence which we discussed before, right? In the last chapter or something that God decreed should happen. So we say it as if I came unto thee in a thick cloud or for the Lord, the God of Israel comes through it, right? These are verses, um, uh, Right? I'm just uh, those that are more familiar with the Hebrew would recognize the Hebrew, the English, the English, whichever one works. Right? So all passages similar to these signify the descent of the indwelling of the Shrina itself, the, the, the descent of God's presence in a certain place. But it doesn't mean God Himself, it means that which He created is, the, is now there. The verse, and, and, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the holy ones with thee. Um, Right, uh, uh, right. So, so all, all the bottom line is is that um, that is the meaning of the word ba, the meaning of the word come. Now, if we can uh, um, go to chapter twenty three, the opposite, the contrary of the word ba is yitzia, is going out, is leaving. Right. So, just like the word ba means means uh, when a concept or an idea or 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 um, a feeling uh, or some sort of creation comes to uh, be experienced by a human being or by by this world. That's ba yitzia is when it leaves, when it goes away, right? So it is also um, it's the opposite. The term is used to the, denote physically the going out of a body, which could be sometimes a living being from one place, and it looked like it, you know they were gone out of the city, or if a fire breaks out. But it also it means to the manifestation of things that are not a body at all. Like the word went out. This is from Esther. The word went out from the king's mouth. Nothing physical actually left anything. Um, 
or when this deed of the queen shall come abroad, meaning the propagation of the matter. Or kimitzion tete Torah, right? From Zion, the word of the Torah will go out. What does it mean, right? There's nothing go actually going out. So the, uh, or the sun was risen upon us. So anyway, the bottom line is every mention of going out, right? We're, with reference to God, it means, right? That God, his decree, which is at present hidden from us, will become manifest, right? It will go out from his place, meaning, right? That it, until now, this decree, this, whatever it is that God is decreeing upon the world, until now was there with God, so to speak, and not in a physical place, but was with him in the sense that we didn't experience it. It went out, now we experience it. And that's what it means, right? Um, so I refer to the coming into being of something after it not having existed. For everything that comes into being from God is attributed to his decree. So anything that comes into being, God decided that it should be so. So by the word of the, uh, of the Lord, the heavens were made and so on. So in this verse, God's acts are likened to those that proceed from kings, right? Because a king makes a declaration and because he declares in an, in an ideal monarchy, right? The king says an order and the order is carried out, right? So that's, so it's an image that we can kind of get our heads around when God declares, so to speak, a certain thing should happen, something should be created. However, God made it exalted does not require an instrument by means of which he can act, but he doesn't need to speak, right? Neither is any speech at all. There is, it's just simply by his will, as will be made clear later when we get more into the details of discussing God and, and creation, etc. cetera. And as much as the term going out, as we have made clear, was figuratively applied to the manifestation of an act of God, um, the term returning, so he's translating, in other words, Shiva to come back is applied to the cessation of such an act. So if God decides that he will go and do something and then he decides that it should end, that is sometimes described as Shiva as going back. So for example, um, in Hosea, God says, Elech ashuva el mikomi. I'm going to go back to my place. I was here involved. I was helping. I was helping out over here. But you know what? I'm going back. I'm not, does it mean God's going? No, it just means, you know what? I'm, I'm not helping you out anymore. I'm heading back to my, to my place, right? The signification of which is that the indwelling that has been among us, the special presence of God, right? Which was helping in whatever particular situation was happening under discussion is removed. And the removal is followed by a privation of providence as far as we are concerned. This is, we sense and we feel as if God was so involved in what was happening before, but where's God now? He's no longer with me. That's described as a Shiva. That's described as a going back. All that, that he seemed to be so involved, but now he's just leaving things to chance. We, so we know in the, in the, in the Tokacha and in, in Deuteronomy, it says so often, God, I'm going to deal with you, carry. I'm going to leave you to chance because uh, the sense that we get as human beings, the way we experience them. And that's why Ramam used the words as far as we are concerned. That's the way we experience it. How much more or less God is involved is always the same. But the, what we feel is God's lack of presence. We feel as if he went back. He went back to where he was. As it is said, and I will hide my face from him. That's the verse that I was just referring to. Um, um, uh, you know, because the for a privation of providence leaves one abandoned. It makes you feel left alone. It makes you feel like a target to all that may happen and come about so that his ill and will come about according to chance. It feels like I'm sick, I'm suffering. I'm Why? Because God has left, his providence has left me. So how terrible is this threat? How awful is that? It is to this that it refers, I will go and return to my place. Ramam just leaves us with a little oi, a, a Jewish oi. How awful would, is that when we experience that, that loss of providence, when God goes back to his place? So we've translated several terms tonight. We've went through lavar to pass, right? We went through this concept, this idea of onkelos, which will come up several times in the future as we go through the book. Ramam likes to quote onkelos when he wants to explain away a seemingly anthropomorphic um, reference to God. And onkelos is very consistent with this. And what's fascinating is different than, uh, there are other famous Aramaic translations, right? such as uh, 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 Targum Yonas and Benuziel and other ones, which often go off into more elaborate explanations and so on. Onkelos is generally very faithful to the words, but when it comes to God, he adds those terms in like Ramam explained. 
um, I want to, um, I'm going to stop here for, for as, as going through and we'll, we're going to take up, uh, up again in the, uh, in Halicha and going, which is the chapter 24. That's where we'll come up. We'll start from next time. But, uh, there was just one other point I wanted to make, uh, uh, I, I, I know I, I kind of change up sometimes the, the format of this and I'm kind of the way I trained, I have to admit, I learned in yeshiva what I always trained and learned when I learned any safer or any limud, any, any topic is I start from the beginning and I go through straight until the end. I don't like, and, 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 if, and I hope to do the more Nebuchadnezzar this way too. You guys are going to have to sit with me for, I don't know, five, six, seven, ten years. I don't know. We're going to have to go on for a long time, but which is fine with me. <laughs> and, uh, and the, the um, the you know mostly because and i'll explain why and it's because i want to listen to what rama has to say if i was going to pick and choose and i want everyone that learns to really the best i can give over is not my ideas but to give over Ramam's ideas and the best way to do that is to really go through everything that he says and get it and absorb the whole thing if i were to pick and choose then i'd be presenting to you something that's my own uh you know conglomeration and you know of course if you're a but I do want to say one other thing, it's kind of indicative of what I said, is one of the most famous sayings, if you look up, uh, if you Google quotes of Maimonides, one of the most famous quotes is, is when he says in his, one of his earliest, one of the, I think it was his first, if it's not that, it was definitely early, way early on in his life when he wrote the parish to Mishnayas, his, 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 uh, um, ex, uh, his commentary on the Mishnah. And uh, before Masechet Avot, which is talking about um, ethics and, and morals, um, Ramam writes his famous uh, eight chapters, Shmona Prakim, in which he talks about morality and ethics. And, uh, and he starts, uh, in the beginning, he says, um, uh, he says, I, in, in a very humble way, he says, and you should know um, uh, and I, that, that the things that I'm going to tell you in the following chapters Right. I'm not saying anything new that I made up on my own, Ramam says. Right. I, I'm not just saying, you know, the, my explanations of the Mishnah are not things that I said on my own. Right. They're things that I've kind of picked out from the various words of the sages, from the Medrash, from the Talmud, and from some, from some of the other writings, the rabbinic writings. And I also picked out from the philosophers, the earlier philosophers and the later philosophers, and from the writings of many, many people. And then he said, and this is uh, one of the Hebrew translations, and this, this is a very famous phrase, v'kabel ha'emet mimisha amro. One should always accept the truth from whomever says it. So this is a, a, one of the most famous sayings in Maimonides. I wanted to bring that out because this is something that today, and if I'm on my soapbox a little bit, you'll have to bear with me, that today we've totally lost track of. You know, the fact that we can and should learn the truth from whomever speaks it regardless of whether you, you like them or you don't like them, you agree with them, you don't agree with them, they're, they're a different philosophy than you, a different religion than you, a different this than you, whatever, it doesn't matter. If they speak truth, listen and learn. If we could only all do that, and you know, nowadays someone tries to say something and then the other person yells at them, but you're a blah, 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 fill in the blank. Uh, I can't listen to you because you are a blah, 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 whatever. You know, I don't want to point fingers at anyone. But remember, if someone is speaking honestly and speaking truth, Listen, and that's that's really what I want everyone to gain from Rambam and and from learning is that is that we should all, you know, seek truth because it's truth and that's it, not because of anything else. So I'm going to stop here and open the floor for questions about any comments. Remember, we talked about by Avar Hashem of God passing by Moshe and all of the interpretations. We talked about Onkelos. We talked about the meaning of Ba of coming, the meaning of Yitzia of of leaving, and Shiva of God returning. And then the accepting the truth from everyone. That's just a quick recap. Uh, floor is open. Uh, it seems to me that that we would have to uh, go through the entire dictionary uh, to uh, to really figure out what what the Torah was saying by by Maimonides standards. We'd have to get a definition for every term that comes, that we encounter. I, I don't know, is that 
Is that am I misreading or misinterpreting? Well, no, you're not misinterpreting at all. Ramam is obviously not going to go through the entire dictionary. But he's he's picking some of the most um, difficult terms, terms that are are can lead one into very what heretical ideas. And Ramam is showing us what these words really mean, and he's proving to us what these words really mean. And um, but but he's going to leave it to us. He's going to give us. He's giving us tools so that when we learn a verse that he doesn't discuss in this book, of which there will be many, right? Or a chazal, uh, you know, a words of the rabbis that that he doesn't discuss, that we'll be able to take a Maimonidean approach and search for the truth. But you see, uh, so we're going to go through about forty chapters, and we're at number thirty-four now, or so. So we're approaching the end. Of this, uh, another couple of weeks, we'll be done with the term, one term after another after another, and um, and uh, and but we're going to have the tools so that next time we get to a term, and 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 uh, many many thinkers after Rambam, you know, uh, uh, commentaries that that are considered Maimonidean uh, commentaries, philosophers, and so on, have taken this same approach, you know. So no, we're not going to go through the whole dictionary, but you can on your own. <laughs> can, can you uh, can you tell me if if Maimonides uh, ever defines like the term holy, H O L Y? Kadosh. Um, or or is... he doesn't bring it as one of the terms that he defines, but he will talk a lot about the concept of kedusha and holiness. And if actually, if you want. Um, Maybe I could do this next time. Uh, I'm not going to promise, but I might prepare a little talk on the difference between the Maimonidean concept of holiness and the mystical concept of holiness, which is actually a really important um, topic. Uh, uh, I might, maybe I'll die. I do want to make sure that in each, in each lecture, I move further so that we keep covering ground. But I think that's a good, but maybe, maybe next time, I'm not going to promise this, but there's a good chance that next time I'll do maybe chapters 24 and 25, which are pretty quick, right? Uh, he defines uh, going, um, uh, halicha and shachain to, to rest or to reside, those two terms. And then I'll talk about the concept of kedusha and Maimonidean thought. Okay. But, but oh. if I do, yeah, but you'll have to trust me when I say, I'll give you what the concept of kedusha is. But then you'll have to realize, but then as we learn through more Nebuchadnezzar, you'll have to decide on your own if you agree with what I say. You know, <laughs> you'll have to trust me. Fair enough. But, but, um, but uh, uh, we'll do that. Any, anyone else want to say something or ask or comment? If not, then we'll call it a, a night. I really appreciate everyone's coming and joining again. And uh, thank you. And hopefully we'll... Same time next week. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.